Thank you. Yes, you can hear me. Good afternoon. Thanks uh, for being here, attending this uh, conference. It's uh, my pleasure to be able to talk to all of you today. I would like to thank uh, my team, Tommy, Madvi, Linda, and Pedro. They have made a great effort to put everything and make this happen. They have uh, worked so hard in the last uh, months. I will talk about clinical research with modern paleolithic diets. And I really like this topic. I love this topic. I mean, uh, what uh, everything around evidence-based medicine. And I must admit that I like this topic because of Stefan. He was the first person in my life to uh, introduce me this concept of clinical trials and uh, uh, how to test hypotheses and so on. So I'm talking here thanks to his uh, advice and what he taught me. This is the first time we, we met in Lund in June 2010. And among the, all the topics that we discussed and talked about, one of them was, was this one. I remember when he said, we should run another trial. At that time, he had already run two trials. And when he said that to me, I said, a clinical trial, what was that? I didn't even know what a clinical trial was. So after this moment, I started to dig into the literature and being very curious about evidence-based medicine. For this presentation, I, I did a PubMed search on uh, clinical trials, randomized clinical trials with paleolithic diets. And the reason why I only included randomized control trials is because even in randomized control trials with nutrition, they are subject to a high risk of bias. It's very, very uh, common in nutrition science to have uh, bad quality studies. So I will only focus on randomized control trials because they are the ones who give us the best confidence on the estimate of the effect. So the result was that I found six randomized control trials with 12 publications. And the number of participants ranged from 13 to 49, with a total of 225. And the duration of the studies was between two weeks and two years. Fortunately, in 2015, a systematic review and meta-analysis was performed with paleolithic diets in the metabolic syndrome. This paper here, this study, Mashabrani, uh, which Linda is also a researcher, it was excluded because five of the patients in the paleo diet, uh, they had initially nine patients in the paleo diet and 10 patients with the diabetes diet, and five out of the 10 patients in the diabetes diet, they afterwards um, tested the paleo diet. So there was a randomization problem here, so, of course, the risk of bias in this sense is higher. So it was excluded. The results of this meta-analysis, they suggest that a paleolithic diet compared to other controlled diets, they produce a greater improvement in the factor of the metabolic syndrome. But only waist circumference and triglycerides turn out to be significant. And in the rest of the outcomes, there was no significant difference. After this meta-analysis, this randomized control trial was published by Genoni from Australia. And they compared the paleolithic diet to the um, Australian guidelines for healthy eating diets in healthy women for four weeks. It was a parallel study. And they showed a decrease in waist circumference, a greater decrease in waist circumference with a paleolithic diet compared to the Australian guidelines for healthy eating. But there was no effect in the other components of the metabolic syndrome, just to compare it a little bit with the previous studies published in this meta-analysis in 2015. But a very common problem in clinical trials is that most of them are on the power. So the sample size usually are too small to detect a difference 
if there is a difference. Today, many people uh, fortunately rely on the results of clinical trials of randomized controlled trials to test hypotheses. But if you don't assess the quality of the studies, then you cannot have a confidence on the results. And this is some, something that I miss a lot when people talk about this diet and the other, and I, I, there is a study who says this, and there's another study who says that. Well, if you don't assess the quality of the study, then you cannot have confidence on the results. For the four studies included in this meta-analysis, we could say that we have a moderate quality studies, which means that we can have confidence in the results. And I also use the Cochrane collaboration uh, evaluation tool for the Genoni study, and it turned out to be a very good study in terms of quality. So we could say that the five randomized controlled trials with paleolithic diets, they have a moderate, moderate quality of evidence. What are the strengths and limitations or weakness of these studies? Regarding the strengths, as I said, they have a moderate quality of evidence, which allows us to have a confidence in the results, which is something really good. On the other hand, there was no reporting bias in any of the five studies. This is something very, very important that very few people talk about or take into account when they present results or they talk about study. But you have to bear in mind that when you design a study, the first thing that you have to do is to have an hypothesis. And then you have a primary outcome or two. The following step is to report and publish the protocol of your testing hypothesis and which is the primary outcome. Many papers, many studies in nutrition, they have reporting bias. Why? Because at the end, they don't find a significant difference in the primary outcome, which is the main thing of a study, and then they report secondary outcomes if they turn out to be significant. And this is uh, something that I don't really like. So no reporting bias in any of these trials. It means that the published primary outcome in the protocol is the same as the one reported in the publication. They are compared to other healthy diets. Of course, anything is better than the typical Western diet. So if you compare a diet against a control group who does nothing, of course, you will have results anyway. They have an adequate treatment of the control group. What do I mean by adequate treatment? I mean behavioral support. There are some big trials with huge sample size and a long-term follow-up where the control group receives much less behavioral support. Even the intervention group, the patients, they receive foods for free. Of course, there is a huge risk of bias in these studies. If one group receives more behavioral support, more frequent visits with the nutritionist, and so on, then, of course, you cannot compare the results. And in these trials, you have an adequate treatment of the control group. And this is something, again, I learned with Stefan. They are performed on white subjects. Why do I say this? Because there is a pre the prevalence, when we look at the prevalence of Western disease, Europeans are less prone to Western diseases. So I would expect a paleolithic diet or more than paleolithic diet to work even better in non-Europeans. And for me, it's important that all the trials, they included white subjects. But this is only my opinion. This is not based evidence-based medicine. Regarding the weakness of these studies, oops, physical activity not fully controlled except in one trial where they use accelerometers to control the amount of physical activity. I know that researchers in these trials, they uh, encourage the patients not to change their physical activities during the trial, but we don't know. 
For example, if someone has an injury in, a, in the leg, sprained ankle, of course he's going to walk less and he's going to move less. So we must uh, evaluate and we must measure the amount of physical activity. Healthy subjects in two trials, so if uh, you include also the Genoni study from Australia and the Melbourne study from Sweden, they are healthy people. And in healthy people, there is not enough room for improvement, of course. I think it's not um, fair enough to compare trials with people with diabetes with trials with people, with healthy people. I think, I think this is a limitation. More weight loss in the paleolithic diet group except in one trial. In Lindeberg 2007, there was weight loss in both groups, but there was no difference between the groups. And of course, this is a problem. As we have uh, heard this morning with uh, Stefan Guillenet, weight loss, there is a strong evidence that a low calorie diet or weight loss improves cardiovascular risk factors and glucose control. However, in, um, in one of the trials, they adjusted for weight loss. And even for adjusting for weight loss, there was still a significant difference for systolic blood pressure, HDL, triglycerides, total cholesterol to HDL ratio, and triglycerides to HDL ratio. So even after weight loss, after adjusting in post hoc, post -hoc analysis for weight loss, there, there was a still a significant difference. Also, in Stefan's uh, uh, first study, the improvement in glucose control was independent of weight loss. So this gives room for some speculations, for new hypotheses, and more studies. Short duration, of course, we should aim at long-term studies. But on the other hand, a short-term study, the compliance is higher. And this is a big problem in long-term studies with nutrition, because compliance goes down. And we saw that in, in the Melbourne study, where we saw an improvement after six months, but then this improvement was lost after two years. So I think this is, it has two sides. Short-term studies, they could be good in nutrition if you look at compliance, but of course, we want to know results on the long term. Small sample size, which turns, uh, which uh, leads to the problem of on the power studies. We must work on this. We should run trial with uh, enough uh, power for the primary outcomes, at least, and lack of blinding. Of course, you cannot run a double blind uh, placebo controlled dietary nutrition trial. It's almost impossible. You cannot compare placebo burger versus a real burger. It's not possible, I think. But you can reduce, reduce the risk of bias. For example, if you design two healthy diets, you can say the patient, you have two diets. Both of them are good. We don't know if one of them is better than the other. And you can just label them as A or B or give a number in order not to decrease the risk of bias. Because if a patient has read a lot about the paleolithic diet and he is randomized to the paleo group, then he's biased. So we, we could do some things to, re the, to reduce the risk of bias regarding blinding. So. How do they work? We've seen some results. We've seen that they have some effects. But how do they work? One possible explanation could be lower carbohydrate. It could be. But this was uh, assessed only in two studies. And the results were independent on the amount of carbohydrate. So we cannot say, at least in the two studies, where uh, we made correlation between the carbohydrate intake and the outcomes. We cannot say that the result was because of this. Also, systematic reviews from low-carb studies do not show that they are better than low-fat diets or other diets. So there is a, a lot of uncertainty regarding the effects of low-carb diets. And coming back to the first part of my presentation, 
is many systematic reviews, they include CRAP studies. So at the end, we have a meta CRAP analysis anyway. Because of lower glycemic load, it could be, but this was measured only in two studies. And again, there was no relationship between glycemic load and the outcomes. So we come back to weight loss. It could be that the main reason why these diets work is because they decrease caloric intake, the satiating capacity is very high. But as I said before, in some studies we have seen that the effect is independent of weight loss. And it has been shown in other studies with other diets. So this gives room to another hypothesis that Stefan loved with which was the, the fact that bioactive compounds in different foods, for example, proteins from milk and protein from grain, they can interact with our endocrine system. And uh, Tommy has an in vitro study uh, suggesting that perhaps on, uh, the digestion of gluten proteins could lead to leptin resistance. Of course, this is only uh, an in vitro study. So we have room for some speculation here and to uh, run more trials. And I think one of the main reasons why they work is because they, uh, they, the satiating capacity is very high. It makes you be full very quickly, so it's very easy to have a low caloric intake. Again, thank you for, um, uh, to Matt B and, um, and Linda. They have made, uh, again, a really big effort to put everything together here. I would also like to thank Stefan and Eva. Uh, I've shared many good moments with them. I, I was almost part of the family. Also to my research team, uh, to my supervisors, Yvonne, Tommy, Pedro, Oscar, Fernando, Ainara, who helped me to understand a little bit more about what a paleolithic diet could look like, and Diego Salazar, who helps me to understand population genetics. Thank you so much, Stefan. And uh, of course, he taught me a lot of things. I am really grateful to, to him. But apart from that, he was a really good friend. And I have really, really good memories uh, about uh, discussing many different topics. So thank you very much.